I'd like to introduce Alan Freeman, who um, is the joint editor of a book series called The Future of World Capitalism. He's also the joint organiser with Andrew Clip Hyman um, on the International Working Group on Value and Theory. Alan currently lives in Winnipeg in Canada. Um, but Alan will be speaking for about half an hour or so, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, and then Alan will come back and so on at the end of the meeting. So any questions, etc., if you can have that for the discussion part of the meeting. So let me go, Alan. Well, it's a really great pleasure to be here. I'm just going to start with a piece of shameless publicity. Some of you have got these leaflets and some of you haven't. They're by um, my co-editor, Radhika Desai, who's doubling as camera person there, and she's speaking at 3.45 about her new book, Geopolitical Economy, which explains why the world order is like it is, and we've all got to go and buy it from book books. So that's the advertising over. I just wanted to explain a little bit about how I got to be here, and one of the explanations I've just given you, because I'm working on this book series, but the other is the part that refers to what I do with Andrew Kleinman. And we, on his side on, in America, and my side up until quite recently in Britain, have been working since about 1992 on Marx's theory of value. And one of the big problems that we've had is that not only is Marx's theory largely discarded by anybody who teaches economics in the university, which is not supposed to talk about it. Certainly anybody who hires an economist in order to get a view about what you should do with the economy, they ignore Marx. But unfortunately, and many people are not aware of this, and more people should be aware of this, most Marxists don't think that Marx's value theory is correct. If you want to Google it, and these are a list of places where you'll find the work that I've been involved in, you may find a piece that I wrote a while back called Marxism Without Marx, which explains how most of the academic Marxists who write about Marx have essentially taken the road of saying there's something really fundamentally wrong with Marx. Because there's something fundamentally wrong with Marx, we have to construct our own value theory, but we'll continue to call it Marx's value theory. Not only that, if you stand up, as I'm now doing, and say, actually, Marx was right, his value theory was basically all the things that he's supposed to have done wrong, he didn't do wrong. It's not to say that everything is correct. He's, in Scottish law, the verdict is not pro not guilty as charged. Um, if you do that, you then get attacked for not being a Marxist. So catch you one way, catch you the other way. I think that when we were doing this, which was way back in the 90s, what we were doing was regarded as incredibly obscure, and if I'd come and talked on this topic here, and especially if I'd taught it Marxist value theory, the audience would have fitted in the front row. So the audience is a lot more in the front row today, and it's really nice after about three months of touring, speaking to many academic audiences, uh, with great respect to my academic colleagues, to be speaking to a room of ordinary people. And so I'm very happy to be with you. If anything I say isn't clear, I think the best thing is if you just stick your hand up straight away and say, I didn't understand what you're saying, and I'll try and clarify it. And I do apologise if after three months of talking to nobody but academics, it does rub off and sometimes you say anything that isn't clear. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's one of the ways you get bamboozled, because the economists say, I'm the expert, and you've got to listen to what I say and believe it, not just because I'm an economist, but because it's so obscure that nobody else could understand it. That's not what I'm going to say at all. I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about things that everybody here should be able to understand and have. And if you are really interested in what I'm talking about, what Andrew Klein is talking about, the greatest compliment you can do us is go away and study it for yourself, because you can. It's perfectly feasible. Okay. I'm just going to read out, first of all, a quotation from two economists. The first is a joint book by people who wrote the main textbook that students of economics considered the standard economic work until really quite recently, and some of them still do. This is Paul Samuelson and uh, Nordhaus. And in their textbook on, 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 on economics, they say the following. The US has experienced numerous cyclical ups and downs, 
What has changed in the last 50 years? Primarily, developments in macroeconomics now allow governments to take monetary and fiscal steps to prevent recessions from snowballing into a persistent and prolonged slump. If the Marxists wait for capitalism to collapse in a cataclysmic crisis, they wait in vain. The wild business cycle that tormented mature capitalism has been tamed. <laughs> a successor of Paul Samuelson by the name of Robert Lucas, who is the author of what is Lucas and Barrow, probably the main replacement textbook, who goes further than Samuelson and says even Keynes was wrong. It's all an aberration. You just go back to the pure marginal theory of the 1910s. He says the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. And he said that in 2004. I once did a calculation of the number of economists who worked out that the crisis was going to happen. The economists called that small select club and predicted the crisis. An even smaller, smaller number of people said that the crisis was going to be a long and a deep one. And it comes out to about 10 people, and maybe more, but I, I don't know. Now, I figure that the world's taxpayers have paid about $1 trillion in educating economic students on the basis of this crap. <laughs> so if you work out how the success rate of economics goes, it costs you about $100 billion per guru. So if the government really wants to save the taxpayers' money, I think there's a very simple first step they can take, which is to sack and rehire everybody who failed to predict the crisis. <laughs> And the saving, you would be amazed how big the savings to the taxpayer would be if they took that single step, which anybody who's hiring an engineer or a doctor or any other kind of advisor would do. So economics is, is really stuck. It's stuck because, in my opinion, it's essentially a religion. I mean that in an absolute materialist sense. It's an organiser of ideology and it organises you, the people who receive the attentions of the economists, to believe that there is no other solution, no other way of doing things, and you just have to accept what they say. So I'm going to offer an alternative, and I'm going to illustrate, however, the problem, which is the difficulty amongst Marxists. Now, these are a few quotes from recent Marxist commentators on crisis. The first is from two very well-known Marxists, who I actually quite respect, called Gérard Dumenil and Dominique Lévy, and in 2004, they wrote a book called Capitalism Resurgent. And they said, talking of the profit rate, but they were saying the same thing about the economy in general. At the beginning of 1980s, it reached a low, and it has since been increasing. And in their book, I think it's reasonable and fair to say, they basically said capitalism had completely recovered from the big crisis it had in 1974, had re-established a new regime, what they call a regime of accumulation, which they called neoliberalism. Then along came the crisis, and it was a bit of an oops moment, so they wrote another book called The Crisis of Neoliberalism, and in which they say, when we published Capitalism Resurgent, the neoliberal strategy appeared successful. The contemporary crisis is an outcome of the contradictions inherent in that strategy. The crisis revealed the strategy's unsustainable character. I'm going to take issue with that judgment. The judgment basically says that capitalism recovered from what went wrong in the 1970s. It launched a new phase of growth called neoliberalism, headed by the banks, headed by deregulation, headed by attacks on workers, all of which are things that happened, but that on that basis it solved its problems and it re-established itself. From that point of view, the crisis of 2007, and I would remind you we are now in the seventh year of that crisis, if you count year naught as the year in which it, the first year of the year in which it started, we're in the seventh year of that crisis. That crisis was just an ephemeral blip, as one of them put it to us, a minor banking crisis, something that was a contact, uh, just a consequence of too much emphasis on banking. I'm going to argue that that's not the case, that the present crisis has its roots in 1974, has continued ever since, and that neoliberalism was an attempt to respond to that by capitalism. 
in some senses conscious, but in many senses unconscious. It was not a forethought strategy that solved capitalism. It was, on the contrary, in many senses, a deepening of that crisis. And what we're now seeing is the chickens literally coming home to roost. So the, that, that's the essential disagreement among Marxists. And I'm going to refer to a thing, a relatively obscure concept, but a very important one called the profit rate. And the reason I'm going to refer to the profit rate is the profit rate is very widely recognised in economics to be one of the primary indicators of the health of an economy. The profit rate is the return on capital invested. So if you are a capitalist and you have a million pounds to invest, you go around and you say, well, if I put it in a bank, I'll get 1.4%. And if I invest it in a factory, I'll get 10%. And if I send it to Argentina, I'll get minus 3%, because so they won't let me have it back. And if I send it to Venezuela, I'll never see any of it. <laughs> and they look at all those returns on their capital, and they basically choose the one that will give them the highest rate of return. Now, the way that capitalism works, as analysed by Marx, is all those different rates of profit that you might get from investing in various things tend to reach an average. They tend to become, uh, they tend to equalise. They don't succeed in equalising, but they do establish a sort of average around which they rotate. That is called by Marx the general rate of profit. Now that rate of profit has been falling in the US since about 1954, basically. Around about 1974, it appeared to start rising again, and it sort of wobbled up and down. And the consequence of that is there are now very big disputes among Marxists about whether it's really falling or not. That, in a nutshell, is the argument among Marxists. Why does it matter? Well, actually, because if you're trying to prove that the US is doing well, or if you're trying to prove that the UK is doing well, a difficult thing to do, but there's still economists that try, still even Marxists that try to do that, then there's not much you can lean on by the way of evidence if you look at the normal indicators. What economists <laughs> look at when they want to see if an economy is doing well, they look at its rate of growth, they look at unemployment, they look at what's called capacity utilisation, the amount of the machines that you've got that you're actually using as opposed to just lying idle, or empty buildings, or empty anything. And if you look at all those indicators, the US economy is now, and has been since 1974, essentially in a long, slow process of decline. There are ups, and those ups are overstated. So between 1990 and 2001, it was hailed as the greatest bull run that the US economy ever had at the time. If you're looking back and you study what the rate of growth actually was during those 11 years, it was in fact among the lowest in the past post-war post business cycle. Um, as for the UK, any attempt to, you know, throw up any, any, any time house prices rise nowadays, the newspapers say, ah, oh, boom, boom times are back. <laughs> It isn't quite so. When you look at the main indicators, there's a long-term decline with ups and downs. The only indicator that might suggest that things are improving is actually the profit rate. So why are the Marxists discussing the profit rate? And I should now, you know, arcane fact number four. Most of these Marxists without Marx spent most of the 90s proving that Marx's theory of the falling rate of profit could not possibly be true. There was a wonderful theorem called Okishio's theorem, which established that if the capitalists just continued to improve productivity by investing in new technology, the rate of profit would have to rise, have to rise forever. And most Marxists believe that. So why is it that the very people who are saying that the rate of profit could not possibly fall in the way that Marx predicted and now paying so much attention to the profit rate. Well, I think it's because it's about the only thing that you've got left that appears to be doing well. And I'm going to argue that the reason it appears to be doing well is that it's being measured wrongly. That, that in, an, in essence, is what my research has been about. Okay, that's the whole preamble. Let's look at how long we think we've got. I would say I've been going for about 15, is that right? Yeah. 
that just rehearses. Um, by the way, I'll put this this slide. You can easily find if you Google me on a site called academia.edu. Good place to find uh, interesting and dissident writings because it's an open source platform where everybody just publishes their works. You'll find my slides there. So, small number of people say the profit rate is falling, but yeah, nevertheless they're all discussing it. And I think it's actually what I call uh, a surrogate debate about the health of the economy. So that's my argument. Because Marxism was saddled with the theory that the US was doing wonderfully in 2008, and the only evidence that they've really got for that is the rate of profit. So suddenly they've rediscovered the rate of profit. I'm going to deal with this debate about the rate of profit by going to a study, a case study that not many people particularly in the US, consider, which is that of the UK. I'm going to look at the UK profit rate. Now, I think I'm probably the only one of two people who've actually calculated the UK profit rate, but nevertheless, I've a lot of confidence in this. If you measure the UK profit rate in the standard way that Marxists measure it, you find that it fell until 1974, and then it unambiguously rose. This is different from the US. In the US, you can have a debate about whether it rose or fell, and Andrew Kleinman has produced very convincing evidence that it did, in fact, fall if you take the right measure of assets. But in the UK, at least as it's at present measured, there's pretty well no, ro no, no uh, room for doubt that the rate of profit, as traditionally measured, rises continuously. Well, there's a big problem here. Either the rate of profit has no connection with the health of the economy, because nobody can claim the UK economy is doing well. Either it's got no connection to it, right? The rate of profit can go up while the economy gets worse, or the rate of profit can go down while it gets better, or, my hypothesis, we're actually measuring the rate of profit wrongly. And what I'm going to ask is, this traditional measure of the profit rate, or just, just to rehearse, this is the real state of the UK economy, and again, rather than rehearse that, I'm sure everybody in this room, if there's anybody in here who believes that the UK economy is doing well, put your hand up and we'll have a discussion. <laughs> so, it's, it's doing better, we all know that. Um, it matters because in the US it appears to fall, but it rises unambiguously in the UK. There's therefore no room for a story that says the UK had a crisis in 1974 and then it got better. I mean, basically, Britain never recovered from Thatcherism. We just had a long, slow working out of problems that Thatcherism has created. So, what's the issue? Now, I'm going to do a little bit of technical stuff. How do you calculate the rate of profit? It's not actually very difficult. As I said, it's the rate of return on capital. So you invest a million pounds, you're getting 2%. What's your rate of profit? Well, you're getting oh, £20,000 for every £1 million that you invest. You divide 20000 by £1 million, gives you 2%, that gives you a rate of profit. That's your rate of return. It's the profit that you make in a year divided by the capital that you've invested. Now, the two quantities that I've described have got names. The first quantity, the top in the fraction, is called the numerator, and the bottom one is called the denominator. Some of you may remember that from <laughs> school if you didn't hate your teachers too much. All right. um, so when I use the word denominator, I'm talking about the number on the bottom, the amount of capital. When I use the word numerator, I'm talking about the number of top. on the top, the money you get as a consequence of investing that. If you take that over the whole economy, there's a dispute about what is the right measure of the numerator, which is profits. There's disputes about what wages are. For example, are supervisory workers wages? Are they really wages or are they disguised profits? That's one sort of argument. Bonuses. Are bonuses really profits or are they just wages for exceptionally hard-working uh, merchant bankers? <laughs> What about social benefits? If you get your pension back after a hard life's work, is that part of your wages that is merely deferred or is it some other part of profits? Those, those are the disputes that have been going on. But hardly anybody has discussed the denominator. 
the capital, the bit that goes underneath the narrator prophet. Andrew Kleiman and myself have developed an account, a reading of Marx called Temporalism, otherwise known as the Temporal Single System, abbreviated to TSSI, <laughs> which is what you Google if you want to find out about it. That doesn't really do with the UK phase. I'm not saying temporalism is wrong, I think it's right, I'm completely committed to it. I'm just saying this is an extension of that, is what I'm going to do. And the issue I've wanted to is when we calculate the denominator, are we including everything that we should? So, what we're talking about in the denominator is what is capital? Fairly important question since we want to study the capitalist class. Since the capitalist class makes its money by using capital, it's rather important to know what capital is. The traditional Marxist idea is that it is what's called fixed assets. Those are physical things that you can see that you put workers to work on and they generate surplus value. They can be machines, they can be buildings, they can be anything in which workers work or with which. It can be raw materials, for example. Or it can be partially worked up machinery, you know, refined oil or whatever. Anything that goes into the system to make products. But they are what are called fixed physical assets. But Marx actually says capital is not just fixed assets, not just things, it's money as well. Bankers get money for having money. They don't use machines, they do use buildings, but only really as a place from which to work. The main thing they make their money on is money itself. A very important point here, in case you think that I'm uh, the reincarnation of Maggie Thatcher, <laughs> I don't actually think bankers generate new value. What bankers do is to grab the money, the value that was made elsewhere by productive capitalists. They're what are called unproductive capitalists. But it looks to them as if they're making money. They put money in, they get money out. So, if we think about that, capital includes money. Well, why does that matter? Because of what happens in a crisis. Marx's whole critique of bourgeois theory is that it forgets money. Very important. What happens in a crisis is somebody makes something and they can't sell it. So they try and sell it. And then they decide if they do sell it, they're not going to buy any more because they don't think that they're going to be able to yield a result from doing so. And they accumulate money. And they sometimes accumulate gold or fine art or they put the money under the, the bed, whatever. They just hang on to their money. The ultimate form of any crisis of realisation is that money accumulates. All right. But what has been happening to money lately? <coughs> money is being converted into credit. When you've been reading about the financial crisis, you'll have heard about mortgage-backed securities and slicing and dicing and all manner of stuff that's sold on these huge inflated markets that London is probably the, one of the two biggest centres of. They are just forms of money. They're just temporary places that you park your money while you're waiting for something to turn up that you can really invest in. My argument is very simple, is that this money, credit money, competes with other forms of investment when the rate of profit is formed. So that you make a mistake if you don't put the money capital into the denominator when you're calculating the rate of profit. If we do that, the first point to make is what have the British capitalists been doing over the last 20 years? The answer is they've been accumulating financial assets. They're not accumulating physical assets anymore. And in fact, since about 1990, this graph doesn't show it very well, but take my word for it, each year the capitalists have been buying more financial assets than productive assets. But basically just shifting money from one place to another. And the proportion, that's what the rise of this graph shows, that the proportion of financial assets to productive assets that they've been purchasing has been growing and growing and growing. So what about that capital? Doesn't that count in the rate of profit? If we do that, whoops, I don't know if you can see the blue line here, but this is the same graph I showed for the UK rate of profit down till 1974, about 1980 actually, and then up again. If we correct the rate of profit 
by including those financial assets in the denominator, it shows the rate of profit of the UK has fallen continuously. The reason it's appeared that it's thought that it was rising is because actually it was diverting the capital that it accumulated away from investment in productive assets and into financial assets, into you know new forms of sticking your money under the bed in the mattress. And it looked as if the break profit was rising when in fact it was continuously falling. If we now redo the calculation, why does that black line not start? But, so the question was, why does the black line not start there? And the answer is because the British capitalists only supply numbers up to 1987. <laughs> so I wasn't able to calculate it back to the But for the United States, because they're much more scrupulous about their numbers, they supply numbers way back to 1970s, 1940s. So I did the same calculation for the US. <laughs> that thin line there, that's the rate of profit that the Marxists up until now more or less believed was the correct rate of profit. If you make the correction that Andrew Kleiman and I have made, you'll see that this actually this line here goes like that. But if you make my correction, you see a continuous fall. Since since the beginning of the golden boom, since the beginning of the golden age, you can actually project this right back. No, that is 1946. It didn't start to really hit until the crisis of the 1970s. And then you did get a new phase of capitalism, but it was a new phase of capitalism that was just an extension of the old crisis. And if anybody here is studying econometrics, God help you, but if you are, you may know there's a thing called R squared that tells you how good a fit a curve is. Well, um, the R squared for this line to an exponential fall in the rate of profit is 0.96 which is about as high as you can get. I mean, most people are quite happy with 0.74. So there's a question there. Yeah. Yeah, there are two different scales. That's right, because there are always some financial assets around. So that if you... I, I've, I've put them together to show the trend. But as you see, the right scale, that's the one with financial assets. And the left scale is the one without. Because there are always some financial assets. What's happened after here is the financial assets have started to grow relative to the fixed assets. I don't know if that, does that answer your question. Because what I'm trying to show here is the trend. Okay, good. If the um, rate of profit is being brought down by capitalists investing in non-financial assets compared to... Sorry, investing in financial assets compared to non-financial assets, why are they still doing it? Why are they? Why are they still doing it? Back why, to why do they still invest why, in it? Why they revert back to real assets in order to get the profit where it's Because capitalism is fundamentally irrational. Each <laughs> capitalist <laughs> pursues their, and Marx writes, but each capitalist pursues their own objective but because they do what's good for them. They don't see what the social result is, which is that overall there's a decline. Uh, and and, and yeah, that's one of the fundamental reasons that capitalism has to be replaced, in my opinion, by, by a different system. So, uh, to what extent um, have you taken the role of inflation, or do you think inflation should be taken into account with these calculations? Yes. This is prices. This is not values, and therefore it includes the effect of inflation. I actually do argue, although it's a complicated issue, that because we're using prices and not values, the rate of profit is overstated. In other words, I think it's actually even lower, particularly during inflationary periods. And there's a calculation I have to do, which is to recalculate the relation between prices and values, which will give us um, an explanation for credit bubbles. But I'm going to stop the questions because I've been asked to sum up, so I'll move on to the con most important part, is the conclusions. So here we are. 1936 to 1979, the beginning of Marxism Marx, without Marx, Basically, people said, we don't really need Marx at all. We can do it ourselves. Then about 1979, you get the idea that Marxism simply doesn't work. So not only can we do without Marx, but he's wrong. From 2000 to 2008, the Marxists basically forget Marx and say Marxism is recovered. What are they saying now? In a word, oops. <laughs> That's where Marxism has reached. It. So to recover Marx, the most fundamental thing is that the spectre haunting Europe is the spectre. The spectre haunting the Marxists is Marx. 
<laughs> terribly sorry about that. Sounds awfully sectarian, but read my works for the last 20 years. I thought that sounds dreadful, but you know what I mean. I think I can convince you on the basis of evidence, not just my say so. So the problem is the left has actually got no explanation for this crisis. I mean, if you run through what you find in the literature about why this crisis has happened, you get a series of crazy ideas. First is the theory that it's a blip. It's a seven-year blip. It, it just, you know, it'll go away. No. <laughs> then you get what I call recovery theory. It was all going fine till 2007. Then something went terribly wrong. Why did it go so terribly wrong? Where does seven years of crisis come out of if it was all doing so well? Then you get a bit cheeky, it's what I call astrological theories, that there's, there's big cycles in capitalism, contractive waves. We're just at the bottom of the downturn of the downturn. It'll all soon get better. I don't believe that. I don't think that's true. And there's no evidence for it, most important, because, of course, whether I believe it or not, it's neither here nor there. But the evidence is very scant. So this leads to ideas that are just not credible, that capitalism has no real problems, it's doing too well for its own good, the only problem is banking. No, capitalism has very deep problems, and that's why we're seeing what's going on in the world now. It's a crisis of accumulation, and it's inherent to capitalism. Capitalism generates a falling rate of profit because the function of capital is to invest. But the more you invest, the bigger the stock of capital gets. The bigger the stock of capital gets, the lower is the average rate of profit. That's the fundamental crisis. Nearly done. Very important point. I actually developed this in response to a discussion with Chris Harmer, a wonderful discussion organised by the International Socialist Journal. And somebody said, well, does it go on forever? Am I predicting break, break, uh, breakdowns as unborn? No. It has been reversed. It was reversed in 1939 <laughs> to 1947. It was reversed during 1893 to 1905. It, you know, it felt there was a big crisis called the, the, the first Great Depression was 1873 to 1893, right? Then the Great Depression became 1929 to 1939, and now the Great Depression is 2017, God knows when. But the first one was then, and then they recovered. And there was actually evidence that the reverse, that the rate of profit that Marx observed and that Ricardo observed actually recovered in 1848. Well, what are these having in common? This was the European revolutions, right? This was imperialism, and this was the Second World War and fascism. That's how capitalism gets out of these things. It doesn't recover automatically. It has huge cataclysmic interventions by classes. What do we need? We need a huge cataclysmic intervention by the working class that takes a way out of the crisis that doesn't involve war, that doesn't involve fascism, that inaugurates an era of you know, justice, equality, resource conservation, creativity, development of the human spirit, universal rights. I think, it's a long discussion, but I think it's very unlikely that capitalism can do that, or that that can be done on an entirely capitalist basis. So I think we may be at the last point in history where capitalism can actually save itself. But if it does, it will be by means like that. It won't be automatic, it won't be nice. So the lesson I draw is that um, this is a very critical time and that the actions we take will have a great bearing. We have a choice. If we leave it to the capitalists, we'll, we'll either get further degeneration or a recovery of the time we had last time. That's not what we want. And that's a message we have to take to the, to, to, to the rest of the people who are oppressed by capitalism, and even to the capitalists themselves. It's about time we started telling them that they're doomed, instead of them telling us what they're doomed. <laughs> that's it. Thank you very much, Alan. We'll take um, questions. If we have a discussion for about 40 minutes or so, 35 to 40 minutes, and then we'll get Alan to sum up at the end. I just wanted to mention I'm a maths teacher, and I hope my students certainly understand fractions. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> Terrible <themselves. laughs> No, no. <laughs> okay, if I can call... <laughs> if I can call two people out at a time, so I can go so I can really like keep track of these. So the gentleman, comrade here. Followed by somebody else had a hand up here. Um, there's an event on Egypt and tweets from Tahrir. Um, and then there's a film um, called Into the Fire, and that's at nine o'clock in the drama room. So please have a look at the timetables and ensure that you can get to all the events that you'd like to. 
Um, but yes, if uh, Alan, thank you, if you say 10 minutes or so. Well, first of all, I am um, extremely grateful to this audience for a wonderful reception and for brilliant questions. It's one of the best meetings I've spoken at for the last three years, so thank you very much. I can't possibly hope to answer all your questions, but what I want to encourage you to do is to try and answer them yourself. It's a very straightforward thing. Marx once wrote, there is no royal road to science. But he still thought that the workers' movement basically should be knowledgeable about value and should study all three of his volumes of capital. So if you don't do anything else, go out and read all three volumes of capital. I mean that completely seriously. And don't read the people who give you the short versions. Yeah. Don't read. I mean, honestly, so many people now go out and they say, I can't read Karl Marx. I'll, I'll read David Harvey. No, what you get if you read David Harvey is David Harvey. It's David Harvey's view of Marx, but he is, you know, part of this current that seeks to interpose themselves as interpreters, Marx, between you and Marx. Don't do it. Read Marx. Study Marx. Form study circles. Join in the growing blog world where you just work it out for yourself. So, from that point of view, I'm not actually here to sort of give anybody the truth. I'm just here to report on two little discoveries that I think are important that I'm hoping to convince you of. One is, this is a long crisis, it didn't just start recently, and it goes back to an integral crisis of capitalism, which is that it cannot accumulate without undermining the basis for accumulating. It contains intolerable contradictions inside itself, and that's why it has to be superseded by another system. The fundamental lesson of Marx, which people always shy away from, because it's the most unacceptable thing for the capitalist class and for everybody that they influence. Second, that the reason that this has been misunderstood is because of a simple miscalculation. People have not included financial assets in the way of profit. So make that correction. I'm not saying the answers all come out, but a lot of things that were previously unclear become a lot clearer. Now, I'm now going to go on to this question of you know, all the different measures of accounting, so all the different numbers you've got. I want to make a point here. There are incredibly large amount, there's an incredibly large amount of deception that goes on. It's absolutely true that Enron, for decades, fooled the world, and Bernie Madoff managed it, and so on. Nevertheless, two points. One, truth will out. It is a fact that Bernie Madoff's empire collapsed. It is a fact that Enron collapsed, and it is a fact that capitalism's collapsed. All right? So that there is a fundamental truth underneath it, and the problem is to get at that truth. It's not that numbers deceive you, it's the use that is made of those numbers that deceives you. Second, it is possible to get at the truth. The fact that somebody produces lies does not mean you should not get underneath those lies and discover the truth. So it's worth the effort of trying to understand the numbers. And I would say simply in for the comrade who said, I don't care about GDP, I'll simply say, you damn well should. I'm sorry, I have to say that. Because the people who produce the GDP figures are running the country and they're running it wrong. And we, the working class, are going to have to run it better. So we have to know what GDP is about. Or we can't run the country better. We'll always be in opposition. We'll always be mystified, we'll always be befuddled. We'll always be with people saying, you know, who moved my blackberry? That's what we'll be saying, instead of, we know the truth and we actually know what's going on. We've caught you at your game and this is how you do it. And the last thing I'd say about numbers is, there's a lovely letter that Marx wrote to Engels about absolute rent. And he said, whenever there's an issue of dispute in theory, I always find the accountants get it right. <laughs> 99% of the time. The national accounts were not produced by pure capitalist accountants. They're a result of the intervention of a very strong left-wing intervention that said we need to know what is happening in our economy. It's the right of the workers to know. It's the right of the people to know what's happening to their economy. That's the origin of the national account system. And so that... Um, it's a democratic right of ours to have good GDP statistics. What we should do is, when the numbers do fool us, we should explain where the errors come from. And that's what I spend a lot of my time trying to do on that sort of number of points, and this is one of them. So that's about the measures. Second, about economists. And 
I've spent a long time on this, working with a body that I hope you may associate yourself, called the World Economic Association, another one called the Association for Heterodox Economics. I mean, just as a measure of what's going on, the World Economics Association, which is an organization of dissident economists, now has 10,000 members. That shows you the extent of opposition within economics. The AHE, which I was part of from the ground up, is that 400, 500 members just had a very successful conference. <coughs> the opposition is there. The problem is, the answer to the Queen's question is, why didn't you get it right? The answer is because you suppressed the people who got it right. The answers were there, but they're crushed, removed, told that you can't get jobs, you can't, get, um, you can't publish, you, can't be, you should not be listened to, you should be rubbished and ridiculed. That's what stops the truth getting out. Now, therefore, to get the truth out, it's important that everybody becomes active. If, as long as you leave it to the economists, they're going to get it wrong. Because even we, the people who are dissident, the people who are opposed, are crushed and suppressed. And it does actually require a movement much wider than just the economists' profession themselves to get it correct. It's another reason everybody should be involved in economics very actively. And I always make a joke, that's never, I, at any meeting I speak about economics, somebody is going to get up and say, I'm not an economist, but. Right? Don't ever say that. It's a badge of honour not to be in <laughs> But that's not an excuse for not getting informed about economics. That's, that was what Marx said when he said there's no royal right to science, but you have to study it. All right, now, next question. Um, difficult one, this one. Investment and accumulation. There's not enough time for me to summarise all of that. I've had it up there while you're looking at it. But I'm going to stress one particular question which is very important. The golden line. There's, there's a line in the sand that Thatcher drew, and nobody has ever gone over that line. And this line is, if the capitalists can't do it, the public must. Very simple. And if the public can organise itself as a democratic workers state, great. But insofar as it can't, the state has to do it. I'll give you a very simple example. Council housing. Council housing basically was never replaced. The investors never went back into housing. Instead, what they did, they speculated on house prices. And I produced a trade union plan for the Fire Brigades Union with a couple of friends of mine. It wasn't published, nothing was done with it. In which I simply showed, if the government builds 1,500,000 council houses, first of all, the entirety of the demand for gap for houses will go. Second, the house prices will go back down to normal rates. The speculators, who are the people who are driving this financialization, will vanish. And you'll get your money back. The whole notion that the state cannot invest because it will have to borrow, and this will create inflation, is completely and utterly false. Because what we're saying is the state should invest in the houses, provide them as a public service, and the rent which an ordinary person can afford on a living or minimum wage will pay for it, and you will get your money back, precisely because the prices will go down. The same applies in anything. That My line is, whatever the capitalists aren't doing, do it. They're messing up the environment, the state should do it. They can't give us a decent education, the state should do it. They can't give us housing, the state should do it. They can't give us health, the state should do it. And we want public and democratic control over the state, but the point is it's got to be done by the public if the private investor doesn't do it. Why is it important that this crisis is produced by accumulation? Because it is because the capitalist's mode of investing creates a problem with the rate of profit which they cannot solve individually, that a social solution is necessary, and the social solution, which they all shy away from, is to replace them. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what they don't recognise, right? And that's, that's why the economists are organisers of religion, because the one thing you can't do if you're a professional economist is say that. You're being hired by people whose living depends on making money out of what you say. You can't hire somebody who gives you a living who then says you shouldn't exist. It's, it, it, nobody pays for that, right? So that's, that's the problem with... Now, Keynes, I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding here. And I will urge you to go to Radhika Desai's session, because that's one of the things she'll talk about, including the relation with the overseas countries, which I deliberately did not talk about, but I've written about them. It's immensely... I agree with Andy totally that um, you know, the balance sheet of the UK capitalist class is overwhelmingly concerned with colonial and foreign domination. Right? But coming back to Keynes, Keynes said two things. It's just like Marx, you know, the Marxists ignore Marx, the Keynesians also ignore Keynes. He said two things. One, that eventually we will have to have what he called the euthanasia of the rentier. We will have to eliminate the rentiers completely, all, all the financiers. Second, he said investment will have to be socialised. 
Now these are random, very radical things, and most of the capitalists have a short span of attention. The capitalists never got to chapter 17 of the general <laughs> theory, which is where he says that. And whenever you try and raise it, they, they always say, no, 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 I didn't really mean it. it's just a footnote. No, he was very sick, because he, although he wanted to save capitalism, at least he was scientific enough to understand how much you'd have to do to save it, right? So I don't think entirely not Keynes, actually, there's a lot of insight in Keynes, much in common with Marx. I was going to talk about the minimum wage and the living wage, but I don't. But I'll just say one thing. The working class does not pay for the living wage and it's not paid for the minimum wage. The minimum wage is paid for by the employers. It's paid by the capitalists. And I may have misunderstood you, but any notion that we should oppose or not support the minimum or living wage no, because other workers are subsidising... <laughs> right, OK, maybe I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but no, absolutely, the living wage is a fu and the minimum wage are fundamental advances for the working class. Oh, yes. The trade unions have a checkered record on supporting the minimum wage. We should have absolutely no reservations what It would be a huge advance. The working class has fought for a fair day's work, for a fair day's pay, since the dawn of the working class movement, and that's the most basic thing that we're here to fight for, and I think we should fight for it. Thank you. Thank you.